We're going to talk about breaking glass, but not the ones on the table in front of you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about breaking glass today. And it turns out that, well, we're really good at day zero, day one operations. So maybe you ask your developer, hey, you, you should create your own application with a database. And that developer goes in, creates an application, deploys it, creates a repository with it, and adds on a lovely database with it, right? Um, and this database instance is now available for them to use. Everything is awesome. And well, what we've done is we've established a norm of creating infrastructure as code to push changes to production infrastructure and applications. Now, if you're in this room, please raise your hand if you're using infrastructure as code to deploy production infrastructure. Oh, good. It's about a lot, you know, a lot of you in here. I'm glad. I'm glad we're in the right place. Um, so you, some of you may have started by deploying on your laptops with Terraform Apply, or as my teammate likes to call it, Terraform, you only live once. And then eventually you share it to your friend and you say, hey, you should join me on this journey too. I should be doing infrastructure as code and you should be doing infrastructure as code so we can collaborate on these changes safely. Uh, and you do this uh, by adding it to version control, and then you automate this, right? You put governance and you put process around it. You make sure you're not just continuously deploying it. Instead, you're adding some continuous delivery on top of that. You're gating changes to production, and you're making sure your development teams are also empowered to make changes to production infrastructure using Terraform. After all, we're trying to follow DevOps philosophy. And you've seen this a few times today. But this process is effectively how you're managing infrastructure and, by extension, security lifecycle management. You're probably already provisioning security resources using Terraform anyway, so the life cycle is pretty predictable. Day zero and day one, fairly automated. As the sort of intro that I pointed out, we just used Waypoint to create a bunch of Terraform configuration for our developers to revision to RD an RDS instance in AWS, right? This is pretty automated. But what happens at day two? What do you do when you have to break glass or when you have to fix something? You have to go in because there's an incident and you can't push things as code because things are really, really bad. So you have to go in and you have to fix it manually. It turns out that some day two oper operations cannot be automated. And beyond that, you have infrastructure and security resources that you will never be able to automate. I see this a lot where you have data center resources or networking resources that you have to create manually. You try to configure as much as possible with some automation, but the reality is you can't automate them. So what can you do instead? Well, it turns out I missed this chapter whenever I wrote a book on infrastructure as code patterns and practices. So I was like, you know what? I should probably talk about this as a pattern and a practice because it turns out day two operations for infrastructure and by extension application lifecycle and security lifecycle management is something we just don't talk about well. And it turns out you need some foundations in order for this to work. So when you break down what day two operations look like, right? if you have an incident and you need to log into a machine or you need to go into the AWS console or your cloud service provider console and manually click and change things, there's actually a couple steps to this process. The first is authentication. Are you allowed to access that production system? Can you access that AWS account? Can you access that Azure tenant? The next is authorization. What do you have access to? Should developers have all access to every service offering in their cloud service provider? The answer is no. They probably don't need that next generation AI thing. So the authorization is going to be really important to ensuring that you have governance in your environment. The final step of securing day two operations is audit. When and what changes were made to production? We think about turning on logging from the beginning. We think about turning access logs on, but it's actually more complicated than that because there are a lot of things people can do to their, manu their infrastructure and security resources manually that don't get tracked at all. And so what is the foundation for all of this? How do you do authentication, authorization, and audit properly? And the first thing you have to do is establish a system of record. This serves as an authoritative source of truth for everything you do in your system. In order for automation to work, you need an authoritative source of truth. You need records of what's going on, metadata, proper information about how your infrastructure and security is actually configured. If you don't have this, you can't really automate reliably, right? Automation breaks because you have an edge case, because there's metadata or there's information about the system that's wrong. So you have to establish a system of record. And you will have multiple systems of record. Today, we're going to be focused on a couple specific tools, but the reality is you have this somewhere in your organization. It's going to be there in a few different ways. 
it's going, you're going to have infrastructure system of record. This is something we're going to establish in Terraform state. We have secrets systems of record, right? Things of how to access other systems. So credentials, certificates, encryption keys, how they're managed, what they have access to, what configurations they have are also a part of a system of record. And you have identity. You're going to have many identity systems, some of which are for users, some of which are for applications. And standardizing and identifying these systems of record will provide you the foundation to automate day zero and day one, but ultimately day two. And so today we've talked, you know, maybe you've heard a lot about day zero, day one stuff, but we're going to focus on day two systems of record and how you put it all together. Before I move forward, I'm going to pause and do an audio, quick audio check because I hear some people here. We're good. Audio is good. Okay. All right. So when you think about systems of record for infrastructure, you're using Terraform to create infrastructure resources and policies. Your identity and access management policies become a record of what people can do in your systems. That's a record of authorization and sometimes access, but mostly authorization. Vault gives credentials to access services. This isn't quite so simple as saying, I will give access to my AWS account, Azure account, or something like that. It is actually the boundary between uh, boundary, no pun intended, but infrastructure and application. So there's a context that you're changing across infrastructure and applications, and they're non-uniform. The way you think about application identity is different than infrastructure identity. And cross-cloud provider identity is also very complicated. So credentials across all these identities will be really important to keep some kind of system of record on. And of course, we're going to talk about Boundary. Yes, I, I brought that up already. Um, and Boundary is really going to focus on user access to targets. So this addresses the user identity and system of record that we're missing. And it's a little bit more complicated when you think about day two, because day two needs all these components in place in order for you to fully audit what's happening in your system. It's not enough to say, I'll give you temporary access to configure something in your cloud service provider console. It's not enough to say, I'll give you temporary access to my database anymore. If you have each of these systems of record, it automatically builds in an audit capability for you to ref reference how long someone took to access the system, what they accessed, and whether or not they've been doing what you think they're doing. So. We're going to get an example of this. You saw a little bit of this earlier today, but we're going to create a key SSH key pair and virtual machine in AWS. Now, you can use Vault to issue dynamic SSH credentials if you want to, but in all likelihood, you've probably started by creating AWS SSH key pairs or something like that in the cloud service provider itself, and then you'll need to store it somewhere. So we're going to store that SSH key pair in the key value secrets engine, and we're going to use Boundary to identify platform engineers who can access that virtual machine. So I'm going to slot that. So you saw a little bit of this today, but we're actually going to dive in into what this looks like. And it turns out it's a lot of Terraform. <laughs> um, and what I mentioned before was that infrastructure as code has become a bit of our source of truth or a system of record for infrastructure, state, and other resource configuration. And so what we've done is we've declared our SSH key pair as part of infrastructure's code. Now, I'm bringing my own SSH private key, and I'm loading this into Amazon, right, or AWS. And this means that I have created the AWS key pair, and I get that information back. But it needs to go somewhere. It's not enough to put it in state, right, in Terraform state. Uh, it's unlikely that you will just reference Terraform state and copy this key pair out of it. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, instead, what you're probably doing is store that key pair somewhere in safe where it is designated as a secret, and you can audit access to that secret. So what I've done is I've stored it in a key value store or the key value secrets engine in Vault. Uh, so what this looks like, a little bit like, if we actually go to the console, we are going to switch. By the way, this is a live demo, so everybody, let's hope this all works. Um, all right, let me go this way. OK, so we showed Terraform. We're going to go this way. Uh, OK, so what happens in Vault is that when I've stored that SSH key pair, it's something that's already state. The record of it is already in AWS, but I'm not necessarily going to reference AWS specifically to audit it. Instead, the life cycle as well as the access related to that secret and the lifetime of that secret is going to be stored in Vault. And so this is where I can store a username associated with that private key, and I'll store this in Vault. And I'll load this as a credential a library in Boundary. So if I'm an operator or I'm a platform engineer, what I can effectively do is set up a target in Boundary so that I can SSH into it. In, these ca in this case, this is Kubernetes nodes. Um, and so what I've done is I've set up a credential store that references that 
key value store right there. So it's hard to see, but this is going to retrieve the username and the private key and inject it whenever I need to SSH into the target. Now you'll notice that I have in Boundary, there's this idea of scopes, and this means that I can set up who has access to what. So if I have a core infrastructure, right? Do developers need access to SSH into Kubernetes or your nodes for real runtimes? Not necessarily. So this is something maybe your platform engineers are going to have access to. So what this looks like in action, if I do this, we're going to go this way. If I actually try to log into it, we're gonna go this. Um, I am shortening the commands. Uh, there are ways that you can make this shorter, but I'm just doing this so that if you do run this yourself, you have the ability to test it and everything else. Um, this is a live demo, so you'll be able to see some of that. But what you'll do is log into Boundary as an operator, and then I will SSH into that node. So when I SSH into that, it will automatically inject the SSH key pair. I don't have to distribute this. This is really useful. I have a team that's globally distributed. And the team, that, the, my team is globally distributed. We don't download and share key pairs with each other. So when I have to live stream with someone or when I have to work with someone, I just set up boundary and I let them SSH into it. Um, and so that automatically injects the key pair on my behalf and on anybody else who accesses it has the ability to access that scope. So if I don't want to connect to it anymore, from an operations standpoint, let's say you're done with the incident, you've resolved it entirely, what you can do is exit out of it. Um, and so if you notice that someone is hanging out there and they've decided they're going to sit on this machine, they're not supposed to be doing anything, the change window for them to make this incident go away has completed, you can always cancel and close their session, which means that you clean up their access to the system and you can always revoke it in Boundary. So you can say in Boundary, I'll take this user out of this group and they no longer have access to it. So the, the point is that you can give someone just in time access to production, you have the ability to audit all of that end to end. Okay, so if you want to know some of this code, I forgot to show you this repository. It's a very large repository. I'm sorry, there's a lot in it <laughs> um, and a lot of dependencies, but do check it out. There's a lot of Terraform and Chain together and it has all of this uh, in place. So we're going to keep going forward. Now, there's another piece to this that we don't talk about, and it's actually something you can do pretty, uh, pretty well if you are able to log in or SSH into your notes. Um, whenever I work with someone else and we're manually trying to learn and build out a virtual machine, for example, and we want to build a virtual machine image or something, um, oftentimes I don't remember how we kept track of our manual commands, right? So the typical way you would do it is you would dump your history and you would say history and copy and paste and hope you remember you, uh, you remember that order of operations and all the mistakes you made in the process. But it doesn't capture the contents of files you've changed if you change config files too, right? And so during an incident, it's unless you're going through like a five hour, five hour recording of what you did in your production system, you're very un, you're unlikely going to just reconcile all of the things you did back into automation. And here's the important thing. If you break glass, meaning you need to go into a machine with manual access and then you have to go back into the system, you make sure to reconcile the automation. Whatever you do manually has to go back into automation. Otherwise, that is drift. And that often means that there is now an exception and your infrastructure's code may or may not pass or succeed the next time you run it. So use, you can use something like session recording to reconcile automation. Um, and this is a, an example of this. Uh, I don't have it live because the buckets are there, but uh, basically I worked with Melissa, uh, my manager for an hour and a half, trying to build a vault server. Uh, and of course you can tell how many times we tried to log in and try to build things. Uh, we were able to audit it, but I chose the one that I knew we were, we were working on it. So that's the one that took an hour and a half. And I can play back all of the things that I did in this machine. Um, every file I've configured, the contents of those files, everything else, which means that Anything that I've done, any commands, I don't have to dump history anymore. I don't have to save it. I don't have to copy paste, remember to copy paste the files during the incident. What I can do is I can copy what I've done during the incident here in Boundary, and then I'll bring it back into Terraform. Now, if you're using Packer, you could bring this into your, AMI, you know, your image builds or something. In this case, I was just using some, um, some of the user data uh, to just configure a few things to, uh, on this vault server. So here, I'm just cleaning things up. I have the source of truth for the manual commands that I've run. And then ultimately that means that I don't have to add the extra work and I don't have to automate even more, right? So making sure you follow through the step of anything you do manually on day two operations and then bringing them back into automation is really important for continuing to be able to automate day zero, day one, and not have to think about break glass or day two operations. 
Okay, so we're going to move forward. All right. So the next thing that I did want to point out, um, it's in a little a little bit more complicated in configuration, is database secrets. Uh, most of the time, we're giving a static database credential for an application or a service to use, log into that database, and then they can just do what they need to do. Uh, how many people have know exactly how long their, the life cycle of their database username and password is uh, for, let's say, a service? How many folks like are like, yes, I know it's exactly 30 days or 90 days, and we revoke it? Wow, I'm so sad. Oh, wait, we got some folks. All right, we got to clap for those folks. Um, so if you know exactly how long your database credentials exist for, that's, you know, kudos. That's awesome. Um, I'm glad you had to say it. So if you don't know, right, um, you, you could actually do something a little bit more, highly, more automated. And these are, it's a little hard to accommodate for this. But to be honest, dynamic database usernames and passwords in, in Vault, and the way that that handles it is going to automate a lot of this for you, right? You can handle the life cycle. You can determine how long they exist for. And this is really important, because if I'm a developer and I only need temporary access to the database, I shouldn't be issued the same static credentials that my application is using. That's probably not great. Um, as a developer, I've done this, I'm sorry, to my security team, where I've extracted it from my CI pipeline by printing it out to plain text. So very secure, right? Uh, I, I will admit to, to not doing the right thing, right? So that's the point, right? There are things that people will do to get these credentials, even internally, just to get things done. So how do you protect that? Well, you can generate dynamic database credentials. And what this means is that database administrators or developers can access the database just in time with a unique set of credentials. Well, why is this important? This means that that set of credentials is something you can revoke. You can set in Vault to say it only exists for two hours. You, if you're doing stuff with the database for more than two hours, then I should be concerned, right? Um, and so having these dynamic short-lived credentials allow you to give developers the ability to do what they need to do in that database without necessarily distracting them or making, uh, you know, sort of adding some tension to the workflow of giving them the ability to fix their application. So let's actually go through this. This is a little more complicated. All right, so a few things. Uh, the waypoint, uh, the waypoint, the waypoint work, uh, application that I spun up before um, created a database. And actually, the module that I have in this database is uh, going to create a lot of things, which is why it takes forever. And that's why I had to pre-stage it. Um, if you look at this module, it's on Terraform AWS Postgres Waypoint. Uh, it not only creates the database, it creates an e uh, a repository for the container image. Um, and it also sets up a boundary target. So what this will do is it'll set up two boundary targets, one with admin credentials. This is optional. You can move this to someone else's responsibility. If it's your database administrator, you can set up admin for your database administrator in a different scope and boundary so that your developers don't have this access, right? Um, so this means that I have a little bit broader access. I can grant all privileges to your admin. Um, but then I have a second boundary target, which is an app only. So this means that I'm setting up a similar connection, but I'm going to tie it to different set of credentials involved, right? And that also means that this module has to set up database secrets engine involved. You're starting to notice a pattern, right? We're using infrastructure's code to set a system of record to allow us to control our security lifecycle and the infrastructure resources. So we're starting to see that how important a system record and having some kind of source of truth is. And this is where we're establishing the source of truth, right? If I am able to say applications will only ever have select and insert privileges, right, for this database, I can control applications access and by extension developer access this is really useful and a very powerful thought right it means that if a developer needs to test their application locally you grant them the same access as your application if it's running in a runtime this is very powerful because what it means is that you're uh, embedding the security configuration by default. It means whatever your developer is doing is exactly what their application needs. If the application needs more access, you can add, always add access, but from a least privileged standpoint, it means your developer is better able to mimic the application's runtime environment, which means there's a little less churn, a little less, I, it works on my laptop and it doesn't work in production, right? So having this one authority on how much you grant, you know, how many privileges you grant to your developers becomes very powerful. So what this then looks like is that if I actually pull up my credentials in here, I'll show you in boundary. Uh, 
In Boundary, I have a few different scopes set up. I have like the Payments app, for example. This is for my Payments app developers. And they have a couple different targets. They can access Kubernetes and things like that. But they also have an admin set of credentials. This means that they can do admin on their database. Again, this is optional. You can move this out. You could give it just to database ad administrators. That's fine, too. Um, and this one is a little bit different. It's using a static secret because I do have the initial admin secret coming from my managed RDS instance. This admin secret is something you can rotate. You can use the Vault database rotate root capability to rotate that root. But in the meantime, it's just so that the initial bootstrap of the database, a database administrator can go in and set up everything. Um, but then I also have a second target, which is this app. This app points to brokered credentials through the database secrets engine. And this is limited. These databases only have select and insert privilege right? for this database. It does not have the ability to delete or create tables or anything else. So what does this mean? Well, if I'm a developer, um, I could go to the client, the boundary client, desktop client, if I want to make it easy on myself, and I get a list of targets, right? There are a couple different targets in here, two different databases. Um, I'm going to go into the database app, right? Because that's the one with limited credentials. And you'll notice that there's a username and password. This is just for the client. The CLI, the CLI, if you use the boundary CLI, will automatically inject this for you so your developer doesn't actually see the username or password. But if you're using the desktop client where this UI is here, you will have the, the username and password exposed. So. I'm going to do the dangerous thing and show you the username and password. <laughs> and the reason why is that you'll notice this is a very long username. It's because it's genera auto-generated by Vault with a lifetime of one hour. So in an hour, you can't add, use this username or password. Um, also, the database is on a private network. So uh, you know, if you can get to it, I'd be very impressed. I'd be curious how you got to it, so let me know. Um, so that's a password. Um, and the important thing is that because it's proxying through the desktop client, what I'm going to do is copy the port, and that way I can tell it the port. So this is the way that not all developers will access it, but some will want to spin it up by CLI. If you're saying, oh, you're a developer in this room, or you have developers who are saying, like, can't I just integrate this with IntelliJ or you know, my IDE of choice? Uh, you could. They would have to spin up the proxy first, and then their application would connect to it to mimic it. But I'm going to try to connect to the payments database, right? And I can select from payments. Right? As, a, as a developer, I'm like, OK, I'm just going to debug, see what my application can and can't do. I can access the database. Um, I'm going to, let's see, maybe we insert something, right? Uh, we put in a, an entry. Uh, I have one pre-written, because I don't think you want to watch me type a giant U, UID. But let's do that. OK, so I'm going to insert an entry into the database, just to show you that I did. And it's not just magic. OK, so it's there. We see Hashi Days Munich. This is like a magic trick. OK, so what happens if I try to delete it, right? So if I try to delete uh, Hashi Days Munich um, from the database, I shouldn't be able to do that, right? Because I'm an application developer. I'm an application. And I only have select and insert, right? I don't have the ability to delete. Permission denied, right? This means that if I'm an app developer and I need to add more access because my application now needs to delete things from the database, I will have to update the vault, the vault role tied to this database secrets engine, right? So that means I have to make that update. But it's always something I can do in Terraform, right? Again, referring back to the source of truth, referring back to the back to Terraform infrastructure as code as the source of truth or that system of record of who has access to what, right? So if I make those updates, then my application has access to delete, right? If I allow a privilege for it to delete. The next time those credentials are issued, that means the application or developer could delete the entry from the database. Um, and similar to the SSH situation, you can just end the session. So if you expect a developer only to need this for maybe like a day, you could also revoke that. So that is the end of the live demos. I actually made it through it. Uh, that's a thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. OK. Yeah, I made them through, and it all worked, so I'm relieved. OK, so let's wrap up. What do we talk about? The first is, how do we secure day two operations? Well, we think about authentication, authorization, audit. What are the things that you need to do to allow someone to access a system? What are they authorized to, to actually access? And then audit what they've done. And the point is, 
Before you do that, you need to establish a system of record. Use Terraform, use inf whatever infrastructure code you're using. Try to do as much infrastructure as code as possible because that establishes a system of record for you to continuously declare the exact security configuration you need. Generate just-in-time production access if you can. This is hard to get to, but if you think about and identify all the ways someone accesses production and you unify that and standardize it, it makes it a little bit easier. And finally, reconcile your automation. I can't say this enough, right? When you initially migrate and automate your infrastructure configuration or resources or security resources, you initially say, this is great. I've already done the hardest part. But the hardest part after that tends to be what happens when you do these manual operations and you need to bring them back into automation so you don't break for the future automation that you might have. So if you can establish all of these building blocks, what this will give you is the ability to automate your day two operations and do it securely. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'll be right off the stage. Thank you.